there was no injunction filed. Indeed, I'm not aware of any injunction that has been filed by um, a, a, any person in relation or within the premises of the suit that we're talking about. Apart from that, at the time the speaker was speaking, there was only a bear rate that had been filed. And a bear rate does not constitute an action into a properly constituted Supreme Court action for, for hearing or determination. Because really, the rules of the Supreme Court require the filing of a system of case to accompany a writ or the filing of a system of case within 14 days after the writ has been filed. Otherwise, the action will be struck out. So I thought it was a little bit premature. And of course, as I indicated, funded on false premise for the speaker to contend that on account of the suit that had been filed by Mr. Ross and Nelson the Frame of Parliament could not proceed with the vetting of the, of the of not proceed with the approval processes when the vetting had already been done. Approval processes of the ministers and deputy ministers who had been nominated by by the the president. I mean, the speaker makes the point that in your advice to the president, you urge the president not to assent to the bill. But in what the secretary wrote to the parliament, they are asking parliament to cease and desist. And the speaker makes the argument that that is more or less telling parliament not to do its work of simply presenting the bill to the president and the president would have to follow the constitutional provisions in that regard. Well, I think um, it's an inference that the secretary to the president made. And of course, one may say you know, reasonably, because my letter set out the full facts and circumstances of the actions that had been filed in the Supreme Court of Ghana. And the first fact was that, indeed, uh, the, uh, one of the plaintiffs, Richard Sky, had actually sought an order restraining the clerk of parliament from transmitting the bill to the speaker. And I said that clearly in my letter. Second um, relief that he sought, interlocutorily, was an order restraining the president from assenting to the bill. So clearly, I think that if the Secretary to the President writes a letter um, relying on all of these facts, I do not see um, how outrageous that, that can be. Um, I think that the most important point is that we must accord the Supreme Court the full opportunity of, of determining the merits of the actions that have been filed before the Supreme Court, rather than taking any step which will undermine such an exercise. I mean, I mean, but they also make the argument that, I mean, should Parliament be restrained from doing its work? I mean, if you have given advice, the Parliament is also a party to the action in court. So why not let Parliament do its work and present it and they will bear the consequences if there should be any contempt process? Well, that's up to them. But I think, I mean, what, what is the point in actually transmitting a bill whose validity, constitutional validity, has been challenged in the Supreme Court of Ghana? And I would say that on all fronts, on all accord, indeed, every aspect of this process is political. Every aspect of this bill is politically motivated. Otherwise, there's really no urgency. There's, I remember um, mooting the contract amendment bill by which public officers are prohibited from, from um, charging compound interest as a rate of interest in contract. That's a very important bill, a bill that has to do with the public protection of the public purse, where it actually has a tendency to save the state billions of cities in judgment debt. The bill was passed by parliament in July 2023. It was only brought to the president for his assent about three weeks ago. And the president assented to it only about two weeks ago. So clearly, it tells you that every step that has been taken in, in this matter is politically motivated. And I find it so much um, in bad faith. I mean, and, indeed, yeah. and indeed, if you carefully consider the statement made by the speaker, with all respect to the speaker, the same accusation he makes against the presidency. He also seeks to be the same. He also seeks to commit the same, eventually. He alleges <coughs> an interference by um, the, the executive in the work of parliament. And he actually asserts that parliament cannot be restrained from proceeding with these processes. But he concludes on the note that parliament in, will be restrained from proceeding with these processes because another suit has been filed in an unrelated manner. What can be more contradictory than this? I mean, I think that these are very serious constitutional issues that we're determining. It's, it's actually a very important moment in life of a nation. We have never um, witnessed this situation that is unfolding between us or before us, a situation where we have um, a hung parliament, a situation where we have a speaker coming from a party in opposition, a situation where we have a, a bill whose constitutionality 
is being sought to be challenged in the manner in which it is being done now and injunction processes. In fact, it's the very first time an injunction has been filed to prevent the president from assenting to any bill at all. So uh, these are very important moments in life relation. And I think the Supreme Court of Ghana ought to be given the appropriate opportunity of determining the suit. Apart from that, we ought not to politic. There ought not to be unnecessary politicking. It's a time that we have to look at things legally and through the appropriate lenses and stop the unnecessary with all respect, tit for tat. That has been done by some people. I mean, before the bill was passed, uh, you appeared before Parliament. You raised your concerns. I saw a report of the committee that said that your concerns had been addressed. As far as the Attorney General is concerned, do you think the bill in its current form can be signed by the President into law if we are assuming that all the legal issues are not in existence now? I've not seen the bill. I've not seen the final product. I'm not a member of Parliament and I'm aware that the process of passing a bill undergoes a lot of evolution. Indeed, I'm aware of uh, situations where Parliament of the day bills are passed will actually effect changes to the bill on the, on the floor of the House. And I didn't participate in the final proceedings in Parliament, so I'm not aware of the final state or condition or stage of the bill. I mean, I think that um, it is important, as I said, that the proponent of, of the bill also be given the opportunity of defending the validity of their actions before the Supreme Court. I believe that copies of the processes of, of the bill, copies of the current um, state of the bill, of course, will be attached to the processes that have been filed in court. And I'll appropriate, I will argue with that. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not in the position to determine whether the bill actually now uh, meets all the standards of constitutionality. And I think I also meet, ought to make the further point that there must be a clear distinction drawn in this nation between support for the act that are sought to be restrained by or prohibited by the bill. There ought to be a clear distinction between the acts that are sought to be criminally prohibited by the bill and support for the bill itself. Because the bill has various elements and it goes beyond the mere prescription of um, gay activities and lesbian activities. I, for one, clearly know that I've said it on many platforms without any fear of controversy. I consider all those acts animalistic, if you ask me. Um, gay uh, practicing um, gay and uh, respect for gay marriages and all that. I find it very abhorrent. And I think the same holds for about 95% to 99% of people in Ghana. But my abhorrence of the act has to be distinguished from my legal analysis of the validity of the bill. I think there are, there are two different issues. Mm -hmm. Whether the bill meets the test of constitutionality is one that will be examined only within the four corners of the Constitution of Ghana, within the compass of the law, the Constitution of Ghana. Mm. It has nothing to do with my personal belief or my personal um, abhorrence of the practice of homosexuality and, of course, my prayer that there will definitely not be recognition of gay marriages. And the President himself has stated clearly that it will definitely not be his time that gay marriages will be criminalized, uh, will be per permitted in this country. It will continue to remain criminal. The laws of, of Ghana, as far as we are concerned, on, on marriage, recognize marriage as a union between a man and a woman, and so shall it be. But the question as to the other aspects of the bill, whether they meet a test of constitutionality, is a different, a different issue. That is why I would respectfully pray the men of God and the religious groups who are um, throwing their way behind the bill to distill clearly the lines to be able to draw distinction between what the bill actually stands for and what the practice of most society also is about and how they are bought and all that. I think that they have been, with all respect, sometimes um, you can see clearly that they have been um, utilized by some politicians for their political ends. I mean, you, you, made a, you made a point about all that is happening is politics. Yeah. There are those who also make the point that it appears the president does not simply want to sign it. And in fact, they suspect that he set that process in motion to not sign it when he opted not to sign the uh, anti witchcraft bill into law, even though he had previously assented to a private member's but that also had custodial sentence in there to make the point that because it imposed custodial sentence, it means that it places a burden on the consolidated fund. No, I would think that that's actually a very faithful view of the constitution taken by a president. And it will interest you to note that before the president decided not to, or decided to rescind his assent to the um, 
anti-witchcraft bill. You have to insult our opinion. It's the opinion of the Office of the Attorney General. And it was the opinion that I delivered after having considered the views of people who are properly trained in legislative drafting. I did not just proceed to sign opinions. Every opinion I signed goes through the mill. It was referred to a relevant division of the Office of the Attorney General, and they look at it, and afterwards I either uh, make some changes or I agree, or maybe I even sometimes entirely change the whole thing. But it was an opinion, that particular opinion, delivered after a careful consideration by the technical people in the Office of the Attorney General. And the conclusion, the proper and <laughs> true interpretation of the Constitution would lead to the conclusion that clearly that bill held implications for the, the, the taxpayer. Yeah. And, and being so, in accordance with Article 108 of the Constitution, it had to emanate from there. From the executive. I mean, I mean, some make reference to the e-levy bill, for instance, not in terms of the impact on the fund, but the fact that there was a pending case, the president nonetheless signed it into law. No. As far as I, would, I can remember, at no point in time during the pendency of the application at the Supreme Court, application for interim interlocutory injunction at the Supreme Court, did the president take any step at all. All relevant steps were taken after the dismissal of the application for interlocutory injunction. And in Ilevi, the case was different. It was not a case where there had been the passage of a bill by Parliament, and Parliament was seeking to transmit the bill to the President, and, and there was an injunction to restrain that process. Mm. No, it was actually an application for interlocutory injunction restraining further proceedings in Parliament, because according to the applicant, the consideration stage had not been um, done with the appropriate <coughs> quorum, mm. quorum by, 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 by parliament. Mm. So it became a matter of, of, of evidence. And I started to say, well, if you, if you allege that there was no evidence, then you must prove. And we were woefully unable to prove. So the facts of the case <laughs> was different. I mean, I mean, consistent with the <coughs> fact that uh, when an interlocutory injunction is filed, you ought to stay proceedings. The speaker, we know that now a process has been filed. And so, even though maybe at the time the speaker was speaking, there was not a motion, even though the um, reliefs that were on the, the, the rate itself did indicate that uh, they were going to seek an injunction. But they've since, they've since filed the process asking specifically for an injunction. So, for now, I mean, we can all agree that it should be put on hold, the, no, the vetting no, of the ministers. No, uh, the, the point is the statement was made yesterday. The statement was made by the speaker at the time that there was no application for interlocutory injunction pending. And the mere statement of such a relief on the rate of summons does not constitute into an application for interlocutory inter injunction. And I think that it's actually a case where either the speaker was misled or perhaps was just relying on, on, on I think perhaps was, was misled by those who were who, who were moving the action. I mean, but even those, they'll make the point that, I mean, when the president was commenting on the Richard Sky development, it had also not been filed. I do not speculate at all. I mean, I'm, I'm an attorney general. I do not rely on speculation and, and, and rumors in the media. I'm not aware of the specific timelines, the date or the time at which the um, application or the suit was filed. The time you spoke, the next day, then the Sky action was filed. Not in the president in, in, in that situation stated that by virtue of the penalty of anti-corruption injunction, he was not going to proceed. I don't think he even alluded to anti-corruption injunction. He made the point that he was he aware his was, was uh, uh, before the Supreme Court, as simple as that. It, it is actually the anti-corruption injunction application which then led to a consideration as to whether the president would proceed or not. And that is when I gave the opinion the president also acted in a manner that we all know it. So clearly, I mean, we, 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 I think we, we must be faithful to the law, we must be faithful to due process, and we must also be very fair to the facts. Mm -hmm. If indeed at the time the speaker was making statements in, in parliament, only a rate of summons had been filed, not even accompanied by a statement of, of claim, of case. And that has since been filed as well. It's up to them, but as, as the time he was making a statement and castigating everybody, indeed there was no such process that had been filed. There was no application for entire country injunction that had been filed. And I consider this process clearly as a reaction to the search that I conducted this morning and the letter that I wrote to the speaker, because they came up to the facts. The search results were quite clear. The former search are conducted at the Supreme Court. See, the copy here, clearly. It says, whether or not a civil case in support of the plaintiff's writ has today been filed. I said, only the writ has been filed. 
as the time. I have seen Whether post the nine. The case for interlocutory injunction has been filed by the plaintiff here, in, and if so, when was it filed? I said no. The other question to no, nothing has been filed. And the time is the 21st March 9:05 a.m. I have seen one at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. was at 10 a.m. That was last night. So precisely. So the issue of the court was also being faithful to the fact, and there's a record of the of the courts that we go by. And so I mean. I mean, what, what, what should happen going forward now in about 19 appointees, critical sectors like health? I mean, if, if even, I mean if, even interesting is the fact that those who the entire action is actually against are actually they were already at post working. But for the other portfolios, they basically can't do much at this point. So we must stop undue and unwarranted politicking, as simple as that. And when we stop the undue and unwarranted politicking, we'll clearly come to the conclusion that the action filed by Dafia Mapo is wholly unrelated to the approval processes of the ministers and deputy ministers in question. I mean, Dafia Mapo's action, the substance and effect of it, is to challenge the president's decision to reassign ministers who had been relieved of their previous portfolio. Mm -hmm. What relationship does he have with the processes for approval of freshly appointed ministers and deputy ministers? who have duly been submitted to Parliament for approval. Indeed, the constitutional processes for approval of those ministers has been followed by the President. Mm -hmm. The President has duly submitted the names of those persons for, for, for approval by Parliament. Parliament has, in accordance with its own procedure, vetted them. I mean, he makes the point in the rate that that list is not complete because they've not added the names of the other individuals mm -hmm. who have been moved. The is that. And I, if, if, indeed, if I were those affected, I think that we even have a cause of action against, 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 against Parliament, against the, the persons who are, who are contending so. Because if I have been, if I were not a minister and had been nominated for ministerial appointment, what, how justified is it for a person to restrain Parliament from considering my approval simply because he has a case against some other persons who, who, who are not in Parliament? I mean, I think that wholly unrelated, and I think this country must be very crit analytical in the way we, we think and do things, and we must also stop unnecessary politicking. And when that is done, I think the nation will develop. I mean, finally, as Attorney General, um, there are those who make the point that the issues that have been raised have been settled in judgments of as Attorney General. Uh, do you share that view, or you still think that there's a matter that perhaps uh, has been presented differently, maybe the court may take a different view? I hold the view that there's no genuine issue for constitutional interpretation whatsoever. There is no genuine case for constitutional interpretation whatsoever. Apart from the fact that some of the issues, I mean, whole partly has been determined in, um, the issue partly has been determined in J.H. Mr. Atenjura, there's actually no case at all for constitutional interpretation. If at all, it's actually a case for, 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 for um, um, semantics or grammatical interpretation. And that is not the threshold for a constitutional action. If the president revokes a minister's appointment and reassigns that minister to another ministry. If you do not understand it correctly, and you think that that implies in English language that it means a cessation of the minister's appointment by the president, the president does not have the right to then reappoint, so be it. It raises no issue for constitutional interpretation whatsoever.